the, so you just moved back to London. I right. did. I'm in process. What, how's it going and what are you doing? Uh, I'm learning about uh, builders in the UK. Um, I am learning about party wall agreements um, and what you can do and can't do. And so, and planning permission. I've been learning a lot about planning permission. So, uh, so it will be September is what they tell me, which is a long time off the original date of July, which I'm also learning about slippage. So. And, <laughs> and you've, you've spent time here before. Tell, tell us about your history. With uh, I came in 97, uh, just as uh, Blair was coming into, uh, into uh, government after the landslide election to attend uh, uni. And so I went to uh, the London School of Economics uh, over in Aldwych, and so. And as, as I have heard the story, you arrived, you heard about the school, you went and got a meeting with the dean and basically talked your way into school and went to school, is that true? There was someone who took pity on me. So I, I think uh, not only in, in startups, but in life, um, you'll occasionally get somebody who does you a very nice favor, and I, I was fortunate that somebody admitted me probably when I shouldn't have been, so. So tell us, what is Qualtrics and what problem does it solve? Um, it, it, a high level, you know, Qualtrics is, is all about uh, surveying, at least that's the, the idea that uh, we started with, and, and something I've learned is when you, when you begin your product journey, the initial idea, uh, in our case, I, feel we, uh, we nailed it, but as time goes on, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, so it, it began very simply as uh, there was a shift from paper-based surveys to online surveys, uh, and how do you uh, take and uh, create a dynamic form, send it out, and tabulate the results. And then what happened when we launched is no one wanted to buy it, um, because most corporations were still outsourcing research, and the only people who did want to buy it were the universities. And so that became the, you know, kind of the, the market in which we made the, the company. Uh, and today, I, you know, they were giving me the numbers. It's 44 of the top business schools in Europe use Qualtrics. Uh, 1,400 universities in the U.S., 99 out of the, uh, the top business schools uh, there. And so mainly, if any student goes to a university, they learn to do market research or surveying on Qualtrics. And no surprise that if you play that out over 12 years, um, it, it quickly becomes the number one product within uh, corporations. In terms of how the idea morphed, it went from just surveys to how do you measure experience? So do you want to know how your products are doing in the market? Do you want to know how your employees are enjoying working for your company? Do you want to, want to understand the customer satisfaction experience and how you measure it at every step of the way and then report on it and optimize your operations for it? How, how many customers do you have? Any other interesting data points? You got the university ones, but any, anything else you can share just to give a sense sure. of the, the scale? Um, the scale's big, uh, 1,200 employees and rapidly expanding beyond that. Uh, to give you an idea, we added 600 employees in the last year, uh, basically doubling the size of the company. And so we're, we're into that very fun inflection of the growth in the organization and, and how you uh, uh, scale teams. In terms of customers, this is probably what we're the most proud of. We have over 9,000 uh, customers and not one customer represents more than a tenth of, the, of a percent of the business. And so uh, that is uh, really, really neat because it, it means that we, one, we have to make a lot of people happy, which is, uh, is uh, a chore, but the right thing to focus on. And then two, that a lot of people have to fire us to, uh, to go out of business. Okay, so now that we know how the company's huge, the problem's huge, um, you talked your way into the London School of Economics. How in the world did you make one of the most fundamental mistakes that anyone can ever make in a startup, which is to go into business with your brother and your dad? Um, um, how in the world? You know, I asked how in the world did you do that? Uh, no, it, it's interesting. Um, I, I was at a breakfast this morning, and uh, you know, I kind of walked in. I was a little apprehensive, uh, and it was all these FTSE CEOs, and uh, and. Someone came up to me and said, oh, you're Ryan's brother, uh, and gave me a hug and said, come hang out. And then after about five minutes into it, he said, you guys are the complete opposites, right? And so Ryan is outgoing, he enjoys these things, he's a, he's a hardcore marketer, um, he has a engine in him, his motor is just, you know, huge and a drive where I'm much more the operational, the technology, he walks in, it's a crisis, I'm like, you know, oh, this is nothing, you know, we can solve this. Um, and in it, it became the perfect yin and yang, uh, and the benefit of being brothers is, uh, since we were little kids, we could beat on each other and have the, the hardest arguments and then still be buddies 10 minutes later. 
And so I, I think you need the yin and yang and your founding uh, partnership of a, of a team. Uh, and I would say in this case, family's an, uh, an advantage because as you think through your, your own business, how, how often you get to a hard decision, you don't know what to do, and then you have that conflict and you still have to work together. Uh, we have it even more complex. We still have to go to dinner with each other and kids' birthdays. And so it, it just, it's probably the only reason the company survived and, and had to go through all the hard things it did to get here was that we were glued together whether we liked it or not. Um, Kim Scott, who uh, was a very high-level executive at Google for a long time and now has started her own company, um, she said uh, that you get more work done in a 24-hour period than anyone else she's ever met. Um, and I'd love to just talk about this idea of how you work and what you do. And if we could get really tactical about it, I think it'd be really interesting. Um, start by telling us what time do you get up and what do you do first? Uh, so when I'm in full swing, I get up uh, between like 4.45 and 5. Um, and then I, you know, and I've read a lot about this. And, and the reason I get up at that time is my mind's racing. The nightmares? Racing. No, the tremors? Just, no, no, not the, 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 the hangover. Um, <laughs> no, it's uh, that the mind's racing. And so there's, there's a lot of studies on uh, early morning people about how there's some inertia that gets you out of bed. And it's normally, you know, hey, I want to go conquer this or I want to I wanna get this done. And so um, I don't like, you know, wasting a, a lot of time in the morning because if you think about it, that 5 a.m. to uh, 8 a.m. slot is when no one is going to bug you. And so as a leader, what you always struggle with is the, is the balance between individual contributing and leading a team. But you can't lead a team effectively unless you get your think time and your preparation time. And so that, that block is the only block I know in a business day where I have three hours uninterrupted and then I can be everyone else's until whenever to help advance the, uh, the business. So that's why I, I err to the early morning side. And so uh, most people aren't disciplined enough so they don't get that individual contributor time during that, uh, that period. Um, there's another trick I do uh, which is, it, it's, it's very simple and I, I teach it to, uh, anyone that comes works for me is the in the morning I take a single post-it note and I put it down on my desk and I write three significant things that I am not going to go home until they're done. So if somebody and and these are not small things, you know, these are the hard things that tend to span over weeks, but I do that every day. I'm gonna get these three things done before I go home. And then when somebody comes in my office and wants to wait 20 minutes. You know, I'm sitting there going, I can let them chatter on, or I can be here till midnight, or I can get out of here at six if I get this person out of here and stay focused on these three things. And what I've learned in my career is most people will get one thing on that list done in a week's period of time because they lose focus, they're, you know, they're operating within the environment, they become uh, reactive to uh, everyone else. But just saying, I'm gonna do three a day is very hard for others to keep the pace up. But once they learn the trick, they equally achieve the same thing and the, all the productivity comes up and the discipline uh, comes back in. So when, that's when, my secret. When do you check your email? Um, I check it, uh, interestingly enough, um, it, depending on how disciplined I am, I try to do it twice a day. Um, and so I'll do it about 11 in the morning and about six at night. What? Yeah. I know, Seriously? you know, but if I've got my phone and I'm at the car wash or whatever, I can go through it. But um, the other thing I try to do is I... But how I, do you do that? I'm not leaving there until we figure this out. What? You check uh, it. Okay, you check so it at I 11. Have this, I, have this, uh, I have this lecture I, I also uh, give uh, junior people who work in our organization. Which that is, would be me, the yeah, junior no, guy. No, 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 but, uh, but if, uh, <laughs> if your house is on fire, do you email the fire department, right? And it's amazing how many 22-year-olds come into business and they're like, oh yeah, the servers are down and they send an email, right? And it's like, yeah, well, yeah, I'm not gonna get that till 11. So you, you have to condition the org that there is a telephone, there is a way to walk down the, the hall, but that you know, if it's urgent, this is how you get a hold of me. Otherwise, it's transactional stuff and if I spend all day in my inbox, then what I'm focused on is being reactive to others as opposed to driving the agenda that I need to drive. And so that's, that's how I manage Do you that. take a lunch or do you do meetings? 
Um, I don't, when I went to China, this caused a lot of um, problems uh, for me. Um, I, in, in Chinese culture, you, you break a lot of bread and, uh, and, and work over, discuss, you know, do uh, conversations over meals. Um, but I just notoriously, I, I do not do lunch and uh, I will uh, nibble on something or have something brought to me. Um, but that's an hour in the middle of the day that it can either be for me or just to keep progress and things moving. Uh, what about vacations or what do you think about a four day work week? Uh, I read the book. Um, I thought it was a good idea. Um, I, I don't think it's practical. I've actually gone to the other side of the equation, which is, you know, like, um, uh, there's a, probably only one week a year where I'm completely walled off. Um, in fact, it's next week. I take uh, my God, I have a five-year-old godson, uh, and so he and his family and all of I, oh, we go on a holiday together, and five-year-olds demand uh, attention is what I've, I've discovered. Uh, but other than that, no, I would rather go to work two hours a day and just keep going ra and to keep uh, the, the organization moving than uh, to like completely unplug. Um, I find that more relaxing. So you're saying you'll go a whole year without taking, you'll work all the time and yeah, then the, take the, a week off? The intensity off. levels change. Sure, and so but it's not, like it's, seven, you'll be off and on working seven days a week? Sure. Yeah. You know, if there's... Um, you know, I, I believe when you have a lot of, um, a lot of employees, a, a lot of responsibility, a lot of families, depending on that, that, um, that you don't, you know, have the novelty of being able to turn off, you know, so our customers would certainly demand that. And, you know, we haven't had this, you know, since we went through the, the growing pains, but let's say a data center went down on Sunday night or I'm on vacation. If you're my customer, you'd be really upset if I'm like, well, it's inconvenient for me because you're having this issue. And so day-to-day -day operations folks tend to deal with it, but as, as leader, you need to, to be available, and that's the responsible thing to do. And there's um, rewards that, you know, that come with that. And what time do you go to bed? Um, I try to do eight hours, uh, and okay. so in that, I'm, a, I'm an early-to-bed guy. Is there something you think about before you go to bed, or like a, some sort of, a, a, you know... No, I um, fragrance or incense that you burn. No, I, I have no like could, rituals or we uh, could do. incense okay. burning or anything <laughs> like that. Uh, it's normally a hotel room, so what I do is I uh, I, I need foam pillows, um, and so uh, so I make sure I got a foam pillow and a <laughs> and, and a thing of water by the side of the bed. That's my whole evening ritual. Um, when when you were working at Google, uh, you were asked to go to China and to really open up the operation. And, and if I have my math right, there was a handful of people when you got there. There was about three hundred people. When you when you left years later, hundreds of how, how many people were there? Um, we uh, it's it's a funny story. I had a partner in uh, in uh, uh, Google named uh, Kaifu Lee, uh, and so when uh, the decision was made of where we put the offices, um, it was a toss up between Shanghai and Beijing, and, and we ended up in Beijing, which uh, t I, I've always wondered was whether the right decision, but it was solely made on where Kaifu's mother in law lived, which was Shanghai, <laughs> and so that's how uh, that's how Google ended up in uh, in Beijing. Although Strategic. there were practical arguments the other way, but uh, but uh, that's it. Um, we actually we had uh, it, at the time of the quote unquote exit uh, from China, we had 900 employees. Wow. Uh, yeah, in, uh, right bet off. in between those offices, and we and we operated in. Uh, five offices, depending on uh, how you define uh, China. How, how many resumes do you think it, you've looked at over the course of your career? I did the math on this um, when, I, uh, when I left Google. Um, and it, it's, if I take the last 12 years of my career, the number one thing that I've done is interviewed and hired. And, and I hate it, to be, be truthful. So when I left Google, I swore I would never do another interview again. I would never set another OKR for those who, who know about those in terms of objectives that I, I was done. And I had figured I had spent of my six years there uh, slightly over a year interviewing. Um, and it was just every job, there's, there, there's something at the core of the Google DNA about um, uh, scaling organizations because that was the ride. Uh, so I joined when we were about 1,800 employees and went through to 26,000. And so, um, in terms of resumes, I can't, I can't, I, I bet I go through 100 for the one interview I'll take. Um, and it's just the discipline of if you're going to, you, you could spend your whole career just interviewing if you aren't very selective about what is, what is willing to come into you. Um, and I, I routinely have whole teams that interview and say, this candidate's great, and I'll read the resume and not do the interview, and it's over for the candidate. So. What, what, what makes a candidate great? How quickly, how quickly can you know by looking at a resume? How quickly? Can you know, and wh what, is, what does that s spectrum look like? Um, 20 to uh, 30 seconds um, it would be what I'd say um, if I'm really studying the resume. Um, the, 
there's a lot of different theories on hiring and, and every organization adopts their own. Um, the one that I uh, am very uh, partial to is, is what's known as trajectory hiring. And so if you were to take a, you know, kind of a, a child from birth and you were to figure out what the perfect trajectory is by, you know, check every box, Montessori school, uh, they go in, in the U.S., you know, all the way through high school, class valedictorian, top of their grade, go to one of the top four universities, go to a selective employer afterwards, go to a top MBA school, go to a selective employer, and now you're available to uh, look at them. I take that if you, it, just as a calibration of the, of the perfect trajectory and then I calculate the delta off of it. And so um, if the delta's too far, um, I don't look at it. And that, that's just an easy resume screen. You go down to the school. Did they go to a great school and did they study something hard? Uh, so if they went to a good school and they studied Econo or uh, let's say uh, my favorite, exercise science, right? So they studied to be a PE, it's not a hard thing to study. And so, but if they studied mathematics there, I'm much more impressed. Or communications. It's yeah. pretty, uh, pretty Art early. history, you know, so it's, it's did they study something hard? Now, that isn't that these people are bad. It's just I'm, I'm looking for somebody who's um, basically, ch you know, driven and does not know how to fail, right? And then if you get a cohort of those people, what it does inside your organization is you actually get a normal distribution and it pushes the performance of the organization way up. Tell me about the first engineer. What do I need to know about hiring my first engineer? Or, or uh, this getting is, a first um, co-founding engineer. Yeah, no, the, the, this is where I think uh, 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 Qualtrics was phenomenally uh, lucky. Um, when, when you think about hiring engineers, there's a whole spectrum. You know, at one end, you have people who know how to code, right? Think of it, uh, you know, because I'm dealing with building. When you hire, you know, a, a builder on your site, you can get somebody who knows how to paint and put on the, you know, the cornices and all of that, or you can get a real artisan on the other end of the scale who knows, you know, just all the intricacies and how to do amazing work. Engineering is no different. And so it's easy to find somebody who knows how to code. It's really hard for, to find somebody who knows how to organize the code in a way that your servers scale, that they're stable, um, that it's future-proof so, you know, they can add one feature and keep adding more and more instead of having to go back and rewrite and, and start over. And so that end of the scale are known as computer scientists. And that is, you know, what I think is one of the most vital uh, initial hires uh, when you start a, uh, an organization. And in the case of Qualtrics, you know, we hired a, a master's uh, in computer science as our first engineer, you know, both degrees being in it. Uh, and uh, if I look, you know, when we were 30 million in revenue, um, we had uh, four engineers. And that was a result of getting the, the first one right. Um, now our engineering team is in the hundreds, but they're still dealing with the code of those first four engineers, and it's the bulk of the features within the, in the product, and that's just the foundations. How, and so. how important is the resume versus the interview? Uh, resume trumps interview. And the reason is, this is how you have to uh, think about it, or at least how I think about it. Um, the interview is 30 minutes long, an hour long. Let's say you do an hour long interview with eight people, you have eight hours worth of input in that process. You've got 20 years sitting on that resume in front of you. Eight hours is going to trump 20 years. That's not a data-driven decision. So if you're looking at a resume where they change jobs every year, but everyone loved interviewing them, this really, you know, hey, why are they changing jobs every year? And so uh, what we, you know, teach the teams and we have, you know, all of the control processes and things is, is we're 70 to 80 percent interview or uh, resume. And the interview is just should come back and explain the resume and the career to us. This is, this is my last question, and that is that um, I really, this is a scenario that I think a lot of people in this room are probably in, I really, really need uh, engineering help on my startup. I'm never going to get my product shipped. Shouldn't I compromise on the quality or the talent of that person because the pain, is, the pain for me is so great. I've got to solve this problem. What would you say to that? Um, I, I refer to that as a manager in pain, right? And so, you know, think of it like a wounded bear. You know, whenever you have a manager in pain, they will make suboptimal decisions. And so you think about that. I'm in pain, I need this so bad, so I'm gonna go higher second rate, and then I'm gonna, every decision you make after that is based on a bad decision. And so all you're gonna do is st uh, stack suboptimal decisions. 
So if you make a bad decision, your next decision, how you manage, how you engage, which feature you can build based on the skill set of that person, is going to be a bad decision. And then another bad decision, and then another bad. And then at what point does it become so much that something that is difficult, being an entrepreneur is hard, it just makes it infinitely harder. And so it's better to slow down and set up your chances of success than to ever compromise on the talent. Um, and by the way, that first person that you hire, you're gonna be giving them a lot of equity in your organization. So if you really value your idea and you really value where you're going as an entrepreneur, that equity is sacred. You know, somebody shows up, you know, whatever the percentages are that it makes sense, percentages of your idea. So make sure you hire the best for it. That's my advice. Thank you for being here. Welcome back to London. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you.